Hello, everyone. It's Sid here from Fundamental Research, and our guest today is Nico Kakos, the CEO of Blue Sky Uranium. They have the largest NI43101 compliant uranium resource in Argentina. There's a need for domestic uranium producers uh, in Argentina as the country imports 100% of its uranium consumption. Argentina has three operating nuclear reactors, one in construction and two additional planned, but there are no domestic uranium production. So the agenda for today is I'll kick off the call with our thoughts on uranium and the impact of a potential or an impending Cold War between the East and West. And Nico will take over from there and talk to us about his project and how it can be a potential solution for Argentina's domestic needs. Uh, for listeners, you can either wait till the end to ask questions, or if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to type them in and we'll try to respond to them. Here are key disclaimers. Please take a moment. Uranium prices just surpassed $60 a pound, up 105% year over year. The Horizons Global Uranium Index ETF, which includes uranium equities, is up 50%. The number one reason for the recent spike is Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Prices are up 59% since Russia initiated the attack. Now, prices has been, had been on an upward trend prior to the invasion due to supply disruptions from the pandemic and an increasing number of Uranium producers and institutions purchasing the metal from spot markets, betting on higher prices in the future. In addition, the global movement towards clean energy has been adding optimism in the sector. Note that Uranium slash nuclear energy is one of the cleanest and cheapest sources of energy. Now, the best way to analyze a commodity and predict price movements is to cut the noise and go straight to its supply and demand. Um, as shown in the chart here, 439 nuclear reactors are in operation globally at this point. Uh, in addition, 55 are in construction and another 400 are planned or proposed. If all these come online, there'll be 894 reactors, which is more than double the current number. China's commitment to reduce its carbon footprint is expected to result in a significant increase in nuclear demand. Uh, in addition, Biden's proposal or a proposed infrastructure and climate plan includes initiatives to revive uranium production in the US. Note that the Americas account for 10% of global production, but 27% uh, of global demand for uranium. With that, let's look at uh, the, the supply side. Uranium supply comes from primarily comes from Kazakhstan, Canada, and Australia. Russia is a key player in uranium as well. It accounts for 6% of primary uranium production and almost 35% of enriched uranium, uh, the material that can be used by nuclear reactors. In addition, Russia's neighbor, Kazakhstan, is the world's largest producer, accounting for 47% of global supply. Now, although Kazakhstan is not a Russian ally, we believe that both countries have strong ties. We also believe that Russia will be able to influence Kazakhstan and potentially disrupt the uranium supply chain, especially after it helped Kazakhstan to restore order during a civil unrest earlier this year. Bottom line, we believe the uranium supply chain is highly vulnerable to geopolitical tensions and supply disruptions are highly likely if the conflict between East and West shifts towards an extended Cold War. As shown by the both charts here, the uranium market is expected to be in a deficit over the long term. And in terms of uh, our long term outlook, we have a number of reasons why we are uh, positive on the commodity. Number one is nuclear energy is dependable and a clean power so source of power. Uh, uranium has no direct substitutes for use in nuclear plants. Uh, it takes to, uh, over 10 years from discovery to production for uranium mine. And um, last but not the least, nuclear power plants have relatively low operating costs for a power plant. As for the short-term drivers, we're expecting additional upside um, uh, for prices, uranium prices due to high oil prices, uh, inflation, and most importantly, as I mentioned earlier, we believe the impending Cold War between East and West will exacerbate supply disruptions. Now, with that, I would like to welcome Nico Kakos, the CEO of Blue Sky Uranium. Nico, you'll be able to share your screen in a second. Please go ahead when you're ready. Very good. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. Um, let's see. Okay, my screen is up now. Um, 
I will give you just a three or four minute uh, overview of what our company is doing. And then perhaps Sid, we can get into discussing some of the very interesting issues that uh, you brought up for today. Uh, Blue Sky is focused in our little Southern Argentina and developing uh, uh, our Ivana deposit, which lies, uh, which is just under 23 million pounds of uranium and 11 and a half million pounds of vanadium. But the real opportunity here is that this deposit lies within a 145 kilometer long uranium district, this whole district which we entitle the Amarillo Grande. And the interesting thing about it is that this district uh, displays geological similarities to some of the largest districts in the world, like some of those that Sid mentioned in Kazakhstan. Now, recently we had done a preliminary economic analysis to understand the competitiveness of our deposit. And it demonstrated the very low cost nature of this deposit. Our, our uh, in, uh, uh, PEA study indicated that we could produce a cash cost of uranium at uh, just over $16 a pound. In fact, if that was in production, that would rank potentially amongst the lowest uh, amongst those uh, mines with some of the lowest operating costs in the world, a very, very competitive uh, deposit. So having demonstrated the low cost nature of the deposit, we're now focused on expanding the size. The size. Can we find additional uranium? So we have currently, we have an ongoing uh, aggressive exploration program underway that's testing identified uranium targets. And this for Blue Sky represents the best added value phase of the company. As results of drilling come in, it has the potential to significantly leverage the company's value. Just this week, we announced uh, some of the best results as we stepped out one and a half kilometers from our Ivana deposit, uh, demonstrating that this deposit is set for expansion. Now we're continuing with drilling with other proven targets located within the vicinity and of the current deposit, and those results will continue to come in over the coming months. Like Sid said, this is all happening in a backdrop. We've seen a lot of a rising uranium uh, price. In the last three years alone, the price of uranium has tripled to over $60 a pound. Um, Argentina, we'll see and we'll have the discussion later on, I understand, that it, as a nuclear country with an unwavering support for mining, is look, looking at blue sky to be the first potential domestic supplier of uranium for that market. The company uh, manages all in-house country risk by uh, because it's managed uh, through the Grosso Group, which is a pioneer mining uh, management team in, uh, focused in Argentina with a 30-year track record of discovery and success. We feel we can effectively manage the discovery and the development process in Argentina. Blue Sky is an exploration company that really stands out from its peers. It's got the discovery and development of not just a new deposit, but a new uranium vanadium district with having the potential to rank amongst the largest in the world with some of the lowest operating costs. This is a great timing for uranium and it's great timing for blue sky. Sid? Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nico. So uh, we can open the call to our Q&A. Uh, listeners, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in or you can click on the raise hand option and I can unmute you. So Nico, while we wait for questions, um, just have a few questions to start from my end, uh, if I may, just to pick your brain on uh, how things are going in the sector uh, and also what's going on in Argentina. Um, with Argentina, you know, everyone kind of knows that it's, um, you know, it's, it's an excellent jurisdiction for resources, mineralization, but there's also some negative sentiment floating in terms of uh, political risks and other risks. What do you think of, you know, operating Argentina in general? Um, you know, key pros and cons, please? Yep. No, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we've been active in Argentina for nearly 30 years now. Um, we've seen many crises come and go. We've seen many political uh, governments change uh, to, from right wing to left wing to populist and so forth. But the one constant that we've always seen is the support for no matter which government has been in power, the support for mining industry. And mining industry includes the uranium industry because the mining industry in Argentina is so underdeveloped. In fact, when we got started there, there was we were the seventh active mining company in the country. There was no 
uh, exploration, no private investment in mining at all. And, and just compared to neighboring Chile, which is a, a tiny sliver of a, 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 in terms of size compared to Argentina, Argentina, by the way, ranks as the seventh largest country in the world. It, you know, the, Chile uh, receives enormous revenues from the royalties uh, of its mining operations and Argentina doesn't. Its need for revenue means that all the governments there continuously support mining and uh, they support the, the need that to, the development of mining. And we've seen that continue to grow and Argentina still represents tremendous opportunity. I mean, how often do you find a new district like we have in uranium uh, in, in a country that has a well-developed mining industry? You, you simply don't. And that represents a, a, an enormous, uh, a, an enormous uh, opportunity. Thanks for that, uh, Nico. Now, Argentina is not really well known for its uranium potential. There's no domestic production. There are uh, nuclear reactors in the country. So 100% of consumption is uh, imported. Uh, what's the potential for, you know, in general, uranium mineralization there? Are there other uranium, you know, explorers or developers? Um, Argentina, I think most, most investors that I speak to, they, are not aware that Argentina is really in, has a very sophisticated and well-developed uh, nuclear industry in that country. They're involved in every facet in the nuclear cycle. In fact, they were even involved in production of uranium uh, 30, 35 years ago. It was all run state run. That all got shut down because the, the state simply didn't have the funds to run that. And uh, some of the mines were in uh, provinces uh, of Mendoza, for example, which is now uh, doesn't permit any mining because it's a you know a grape and wine producing area. It's no different than having uh, <laughs> trying to set up a uranium mine in the middle of Napa Valley. It just simply would be a no go or any kind of mine there. But right now, uh, you, Argentina. The neat thing about it, with you know, since it's been involved in the mining industry for, since the 1950s. All the rules and laws and regulations for handling and moving uh, radioactive materials around in the country, they're already there. They're already implemented. And that for us means a potential to be able to fast track any kind of production decision uh, at some point because we wouldn't have to wait for the government to debate and, uh, and, and begin to implement all these laws. They're already put in place. In fact, in Argentina, they even have their own pilot enrichment plant and that's in the, actually situated in the same province where uh, our deposit is. Uh, the, the country right now, as you said, uh, imports all its uranium needs. Most of it comes from Kazakhstan and they pay a premium. They pay up to about $75 a pound to get the, to get the uranium in to be able to feed uh, the nuclear reactors there. Uh, Argentina does have a, a law that stipulates that if there is domestic uh, uranium available, uh, all its nuclear reactors must be fed uh, by law by domestic supply. And that of course would be purchased at world prevailing prices. So we are uh, working with the all uh, levels of Argentina's governments to become uh, a domestic supplier for Argentina. And uh, of course, with the potential that we have, we would end up becoming uh, net exporters of uranium uh, as well. Got it. Are there other or majors or any significant players looking at uranium right there? Well, there, there is no other. Uh, we Right now, what we have is the largest and most advanced project in, uh, in uh, uranium in Argentina. Uh, there has been a couple of other smaller uh, deposits, uh, but they're, they, they, they're a no-go right now. Um, there's the Argentinian Atomic Energy Commission, uh, which I believe owns the uh, Cerro Solo deposit in the southern province there of uh, Chubut. That's a no-go there because simply I, I don't think they've got the funding to take it forward and the province is you know less uh, less receptive to any kind of mining activity there. So however that being said uh, we've seen in the last few years uh, a commitment by no, Russia and by China to become major uh, investors in, in Argentina in, uh, for developing uranium and looking for uranium. So there are other people looking in there. And besides that, um, I've, I myself have spoken to a number of mid-tier and, and larger size uranium companies that are very closely following our developments there. Okay. Moving on to the project, uh, it's a near-surface project 
But the grades are relatively low when you look at uh, global uranium uh, projects. Um, now, how does that, is that a challenge? Uh, how do you come, uh, you know, work around that? Um, it's not a challenge. I mean, to, to, to say that, the, you know, an adjective that, you know, the grades are low, uh, it doesn't apply to every situation. Every deposit is different. Um, sure, if, uh, if our project was located in the Athabasca region of uh, Canada and buried a few kilometers underground, under frozen ground, um, yeah, that would be quite low. But, you know, our grades are exactly in line uh, with the grades that they have in, uh, in Kazakhstan, which is, by the way, supplies about half of the world's uranium right now. And, and, and they, they use ISR in situ uh, recovery uh, technology to extract the uranium because ours uh, deposit is situated uh, in the first uh, 25 meters of surface. We don't need to apply that technology. It's a, it's a very simple way to get it out. You just need a digger and, uh, and the process is very, very cheap. There is potential for deeper um, uh, deposits in, in, in our uh, uh, project, but right now I think we're really focusing on the low lying fruit and the grades, you know, I think when you look at the economic studies at PEA that we published, you know, if we had higher grades, it would, you know, it, our costs are still uh, running at six, just over $16 a pound. So I think that's a, I think that demonstrates that we have more than sufficient grade. Okay. Just to give our listeners more perspective, more color, uh, can you compare your deposit to the ones in Saskatchewan or, you know, in, in Canada in general? Just to so that they understand how the importance of near surface, uh, the grades and everything. Well, um, in, in near surface, our project, like I said, is our cash costs, you know, to produce there are running around just over sixteen dollars a pound. In in other parts of the world, in like places like in Canada, you're looking at fifty-five, sixty, seventy dollars a pound in order for the, those mines to break even. So simply, they're they're harder to get at, the, and they're more expensive to get at and uh, the costs are, are higher so they need the higher grade in order to justify that to make up for that higher cost in our area it's a very simple project uh to put into production it really is not much different than uh, than a gravel pit operation and uh it's all the technology that we would be using there is tried and tested and true it's uh, we're not reinventing the wheel or anything like that so uh, at the end of the day, it, it all comes down to engineering and uh, economics, and that's really, and, and, and profitability, and uh, the, the grade is just one component of that. Yeah, I guess one of the biggest aspects always going to be is the low transportation costs or minimal transportation costs versus current options uh, for Argentina. Well, yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have to tr put our, our, our uranium onto ships and ship it too far away if we sell uh, a bunch of it domestically. But then there are other potential users, uh, you know, within uh, South America that uh, we could export uh, the reigning, uh, uh, any, any excess uranium that we would have. Okay. Now, obviously, you are bullish on the sector. You're bullish on uranium prices. That's why you have this business. But just wanted to get an idea of what pricing do you use for your internal models? I know the PEA is $50 a pound US. Um, what's kind of your uh, internal to make? You know, project financing decisions, or when you talk to institutions, what pricing do they use? So what's the, what are the, I mean, the question really is, what are the investors or institutional investors using these days? And when you talk to them, uh, you know? Well, I mean, right now, you know, we're focused on, on our exploration, focused on identifying additional uh, pounds of uranium, because I think that's where uh, the opportunity for our shareholders really lies. It's a relatively low cost to do the drilling and uh, to, to find additional pounds. And as we do that, then I'm expecting in the next few months that we're going to begin to move the project towards pre-feasibility stage. And that's, it's at that point that we're going to look at that very carefully and, and in that environment. It's difficult to pinpoint uh, a uranium price because it's rising uh, at such a rapid rate right now the market for uranium, as you know, is a is a very small market, and it doesn't take much to disrupt it. And right now, there's so many um, factors out there that are influencing the price of uranium. You know, you could easily see it double in, or even triple from here in the next uh, couple of years. Got it. 
The, I remember the last uh, uranium when prices spiked uh, over 10, 12 years ago. Um, what one smart thing, what all uranium explorers or juniors did was they went out and raised a lot of capital uh, and then they were highly successful and which lasted them for years, uh, even though prices crashed after that. These uranium juniors were sitting on a lot of cash. Now, are you seeing the trend? Uh, do you have plans yourself to go and raise significant capital when timing is good? Well, we have plans to raise capital, but not crazy amount of money. We're mindful of the dilution uh, effect that it would have on our shares and on our and our stock and our evaluation. Ultimately, I think uh, you know, uh, right now I can foresee raising another two or three million dollars, which is a small amount of money. And then as we get to the feasibility study, you know, that's the kind of study that would probably range in cost anywhere between ten to fifteen million, and we would venture to raise that money at that time uh at market prices at that time so uh, you know it, it, the idea being of course if we uncover more pounds of uranium uh we'd have a much more favorable uh valuation in the market and be able to have a much less dilution in our stock got it just uh just to point out to our listeners on the project economics the pea had shown an after tax npv at eight percent of uh, 135 million US and uh, uh, Blue Skies' current market cap is uh, around $42 million US. So it's trading at about uh, 25, 30% of its after tax and PV. Um, in terms of, you know, your perspective in, you know, just to get your thoughts on what's going on these days, um, are you expecting like what we are expecting is uh, maybe a potential Cold War uh, more supply disruptions. Uh, what are your thoughts um, for the next six to twelve months? Well, I, I, I'm not an expert in in in, polit in, in geopolitical analysis, but uh, <clears throat> what I do know is in business, and I'm watching the, the the whole nuclear market and the uranium market. I know, for example, that uh, like you stated, you know, with Kazakhstan supplying, uh, you know, up to about half of the world's uranium. And then Russia being the country where another 40% of the world's uranium is enriched so that it can be used as fuel. Um, this, this would cause angst to any uh, nuclear, re, uh, nuclear utility because uh, as sanctions begin to kick in and some potential supply disruptions, um, I think what we're seeing right now is uh, anxiously, a lot of utilities are, are jumping into the market and trying to you know, buy up and create good long-term agreements with uh, suppliers of uranium that can come from relatively safe jurisdictions. And I think uh, that's what that's what places Blue Sky in a very, very favorable light right now. Got it. Now, what's your long-term vision? Um, do you plan to expand within the uranium space, uh, maybe within Argentina, or your main goal is to just advance the production? Well, we've got a huge package of project uh, in Argentina, 300,000 hectares. It represents a corridor, like I said, about 145 kilometers long by 50 kilometers wide. It is an enormous section. Um, to be able to effectively uh, drill it out and uh, prove up deposits along this whole area is something that will take a very long time. I mean, you look at comparable, because in, in Kazakhstan, these districts, they've developed uh, and identified all their various uh, uranium deposits there over a course of 50 years. So we're focused on the most southern part of the sector, uh, the first uh, 30 kilometers or so. There's enough potential there to make a, a few uh, uranium deposits. And then at that point, we, you know, we, like I said, we go into a PFS and then potentially go into production in partnership, of course, uh, with a major company. And then we could step up and continue to assess the, the potential of the, the balance of the project. It would be taken over a number of years, but it would be done in a gradual and stepwise approach. Okay. Just the final few more, uh, Nico, if I may. Um, looking at the project development or timelines, you know, historically projects uh, for uranium, it has taken more than 10 years from scratch to, you know, taking into commercial production. What, what's your timeline for this project, assuming, you know, the timelines and the milestones are achieved? Well, um, yeah, because of the simple nature of the type of mining that's envisioned, 
uh, and taking advantage of the fact that uh, regulation for uh, you know uranium and radioactive materials in Argentina is already in place, um, I could see a much shorter time frame than ten years. If if a pre feasibility study would last about a year, that would you know that would put us into twenty twenty three, and and I think the next two or three years after that, conceivably, the project could be in production. So it's a much much shorter timeline than ten years. Okay. Nico, I don't see any more questions. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts? And maybe you can highlight some key upcoming catalysts for listeners. Well, yeah, uh, we've got, you know, we just announced this week a nice step out hole, like I said, uh, at my opening that uh, demonstrates the expansion potential uh, of, of our current deposit. Uh, we're just mobilizing right now to an, another target 10 kilometers north of this target. Uh, we're going to be drilling. I expect drilling to continue for the next uh, four to five months. And during that period, we're going to have a constant news flow. And I think uh, if results come back, as we hope they will, uh, and, and the background, the uranium market continues to rise in the, in the way that it has been, uh, Blue Sky is on a trajectory to be very, very, uh, prof you know, very, very beneficial to uh, shareholders. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nico, and everyone on the call. Uh, for taking time today. The recording will be uploaded on our YouTube channel shortly. Please ensure you subscribe to our channel and also sign up to be a member of, the, of our platform, researchfrc.com. We have our initiating report on Blue Sky with a fair value estimate. Uh, if you would like to see how we arrived at our valuation, please make sure you check that out, researchfrc.com. And um, if you become a member, you'll get alerts when we publish new reports. And of course, you'll see, you'll be able to see our list of top picks. Thanks again and wish you all the best and stay safe. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.